U.S. President Donald Trump was on the defensive recently, denying that recent tweets against four women of color were not racist. Trump told the four Democrats to stop complaining about his policy or they could leave the United States. Now, joining me now to discuss this is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me from Los Angeles via Skype. Lisa, is this more about red and blue, as in the colors of the Republicans and Democrats, rather than black and white? Oh, you know, that, that's a great question and a great setup. Um, it's very difficult to side with Donald Trump when he actually, the, the content of what he's saying, may, there's some truth to it. So far be it from me to ever defend anything or justify or condone anything that is actually racist or actually sexist or actually would marginalize four women. But in this case, you have four elected officials who do nothing but hate on this country. And especially at a time when the United States, we're, li we're living in a climate where you know, immigration is, is one of the biggest issues of our time. And it's a privilege to live in this country. And I think that, that and again, far be it from me to translate into what Donald Trump is trying to say, but I do believe that what he's trying to say is, if you don't like it here, you could leave. It's a privilege to live here. So, you know, I think he's talking more about the constant complaints and America bashing that you see from these four individuals um, more than anything else. I think people who are elected to office, it's usually because you know, you become the CEO of a company because you believe in the company, you believe in the product, and you believe in the business. Uh, and you don't see that from, from these individuals. And they've created this environment of, of just hate and, and bashing and d division. And of course, their first go-to is racism. He was racist in his tweet and we're from this country. And let me tell you, I was born in this country, but if someone told me go home to your country, I understand what that means because I'm the daughter of immigrants. So that means I would go back to the, the country that my parents came from. Why? Because I am cognizant of the blessing that it is to live in the United States. Uh, and I think that that's what he is trying to get out. Again, um, the rhetoric can be toned down, the tweets can be kinder and um, much more, um, I don't know, I don't know. You know, I don't know if, if any tweet that he puts out would ever be well received by both sides. I think it is blue and, and, and red, as you said in your, in your initial question. But I, I do think that it could be stated in a way that's better understood. Yeah, you know, and sometimes perhaps Mr. Trump needs a, a filter. Let's <laughs> just put it that way, maybe a filter. Sometimes. Or a communications person yes, who can actually right. get through to him. I don't know. I would volunteer because I always feel like, well, if you just said it this way, <laughs> it would be well understood. Lisa, Iran says it is willing to negotiate if the United States lifts sanctions. Now, the president of Iran says his country would hold talks with the Americans if it returns to the 2015 nuclear deal. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, Iran hasn't stuck to the terms of a nuclear deal, so they're expecting America to go back to the, the terms of a nuclear deal. How, how convenient. Um, you know, this more of this exchange. First, last week, they said that they would never come back to the nuclear deal. They don't want the nuclear deal. Uh, they're trying to get into deals with other countries, and, and particularly with the Europeans. But with the United States, they're done. They're not going to negotiate. Uh, they believe they have the upper hand. Of course, the Trump administration believes they have the upper hand. Uh, and, you know, it's um, it's more of the same. We haven't seen any good behavior come out of the Iranian regime, not with regards to their regional uh, activities, not with regards to their human rights. And I know people will say those two things were not part of the Iran deal in 2015. And that's that's true. Um, but what was part of the deal was the the, the to, to bind them to a, a nuclear deal that would mean non-proliferation, that would mean less uh, enrichment of uranium, that would mean, uh, you know, not trying to uh, work circles around the, the sanctions that are meant for their weapons program. And they did all that. So um, I don't know if there's any rewarding of good behavior here, but they're definitely not the ones to call the shots if there is to be further negotiations down the line. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has granted a visa to Iran's top diplomat to visit New York. But, Lisa, it does have some restrictions to it. Yeah, well, you know, this happens every year. Well, it usually happens in September where we have the uh, U.N. General Assembly. You have uh, what the president of Iran and more um, recently you have their foreign minister, Zarif, who comes over. He speaks perfect English. He is a career diplomat speaks very well, 
and he goes on all these shows. And he did this just a, a couple months ago where he went on all the Sunday morning shows and was able to say, you know, we don't have any problem with human rights. We don't have any problem with, um, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And to point the fingers at the United States and to Trump's behavior. And that's why the world is a mess. Um, why should we give him this opportunity? I don't know. Why should we give him this, these platforms? I don't know. Uh, Mike Pompeo obviously is further to the left than Donald Trump and other advisors that are in the Trump cabinet, namely John Bolton. Um, and how that is being, um, or how that influence is factoring into the overall Iran U uh, foreign policy is yet to be determined. But I think there is something to be said about playing good cop, bad cop, and allowing um, some freedoms, but as you said, with restrictions, uh, to not give them free reign as they have had over the past few years. The United Kingdom over the weekend tied the release of an Iranian oil tanker to a guarantee it would not go to Syria. Now, Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt told his Iranian counterpart he would facilitate the release of the Grace One, which the British military says was seized off the coast of Gibraltar last week. Right. So the, the UK doesn't want this to escalate, but they have to because it's, you know, it, it's a national pride, right? And, and the thing is, when you have this confrontation with Iran, it's very difficult. Do you back down? Do you go forward? Do you flex your mu muscles? So there has to be some sort of contingency, right? So the UK says, you know what, we'll, we'll allow you to have your um, vessel back, but you, you have to promise us that it won't be going to Syria. Well, what are what are Iran, the Iranian regime's promises good for? Um, and and of course we know that this is going to be more of the same. But again, you have this you know carrot and stick type of diplomacy. You have you know whether it's the United States, the Europeans, you have this this belief that there can be traditional diplomacy when it comes to the Iranian regime. Um, and it baffles me how they continue to have this type of rhetoric when it comes to the Iranians. Um, and, you know, I guess the, the, the counter argument to that would be, what is the alternative? Is it to go to war? Is it to continue the sanctions? Is it just this pressure campaign that has actually been working to a certain degree? Uh, obviously, economically, it's been working. So we'll see where this rhetoric gets the UK and whether there will be a deal that's made, whether they'll get their, their boat back uh, and, and how this will play out. Europe's biggest powers, including Germany, Britain, and France, are calling for dialogue to prevent the collapse of the nuclear deal. Tell me more about that. Right. So it's it's a little bit um, awkward, is a good word, when you have this uh, confrontation of Iran with the West. And when I say West, it's obviously with the UK over this situation in the waters, with the United States, of course, you know, pulling out of the P5 plus one nuclear deal. But then all of a sudden, the Europeans really don't want to let this go and it's hanging on by a string. There is nothing to keep this deal in place. We know that the Iranians uh, have have gone against their word. We have proof. Uh, we've seen the sites. We've seen they've actually claimed that they are enriching their uranium and the Europeans got nervous and said, please don't. You know, we prefer you to kind of keep to the, the, the deal until we can figure this out and hopefully renew the deal. And it looks really awkward, but I think the Europeans would want and um, see so much potential in an Iranian uh, trading partner, but again, not at the cost of severing ties with the United States. I don't think they can afford to do that. Uh, but if they can manage to have this balancing act between having a lukewarm relationship with the United States, which is enough, uh, and going forward with whatever they've had in the past in terms of economic ties with the Iranian regime, then they'll take that. According to the Times of Israel, a senior Hamas official is calling on Palestinians to stab and kill Jews around the world. It's very sad, Lisa, but I guess nothing new to see here, right? Right, and you have this, uh, you know, on the eve of when the uh, peace plan will be rolled out from the White House. We already saw an economic plan for the Palestinians and their future and their prosperity, uh, to which they scoffed and they didn't even show up to the Bahrain conference. And now, uh, you know, just weeks before we have any indication when, we don't have any indication when exactly this will be uh, rolled out, but very soon, uh, when we have a peace plan, you have an announcement by an, a top official. Now, remember, Hamas is a terror organization, but they're also the official and recognized 
leadership of the Palestinian people announced that it's not enough to just kill Jews in Israel, to go after the Israeli soldiers, to kill people on the border, to go into pizza shops and buses and wherever else and kill Jews. You should kill them wherever you see them. Uh, and if you live abroad, then you should do it there, whether it's in the United States, in Canada or Mexico, wherever you see Jews, you should kill them. Um, more of the same, you know, I don't think that this is an easy situation. I do believe that the Palestinian people deserve better, but they deserve better from their own government. When you have a terror organization governing you and telling you to kill people, I mean, what kind of psyche does that create from, from childhood? Uh, and, and what kind of future are we hoping for? I mean, we can remain optimistic, but it doesn't look good. Lisa, a new study has found that about half of China's loans to developing countries are hidden. Shocker, right? That China would have such clandestine economic operations under the table. We don't know about them. Uh, more of the same. But I, but I do believe that it is important for us um, as, you know, of the West, uh, the United States, if we want to sit down with China uh, to delve into all of their secret um, uh, actions and behaviors, because that these these are con these are conditions that should be included in any deal going forward. Now, remember, it's not just about the tariffs; it's not just about import and export. That's actually the part of the relationship with China that we've enjoyed here in the West. The issue with China is that they are going behind our backs, and when they steal patents and they steal copyrights and they, uh, you know, kind of throw us for a loop when it comes to cybersecurity and tech uh, and things like that, then we really need to watch our backs. And this is yet another report that shows us that their behavior, their activities, their actions have not been obviously straightforward. They have loans. They have um, obviously an interest in growing their sphere of influence. We know that. Many of these loans and activities happen in the African continent, in the Latin American continent. And why is that? Because these are places that are up for grabs. And China offers them Wi-Fi, offers them a phone line uh, in places that are, you know, don't even have toilets. Uh, and they take it and they take it and they get, you know, an 80 year loan or whatever it may be. And China has dibs. They put their footprints all over the globe. And this is where we should be following them. Very important to follow this and very important to make this part of the deal before we sit down with China once again. Not only have immigration officials have had their hands filled with illegal border crossers, but Lisa, border agents in the U.S. and Mexico border made a huge drug bust when they found $1.7 million worth of meth found hidden in an SUV. Yeah, I wonder if that's in pesos or dollars or what kind of, uh, <laughs> what, how much that was. It's a lot. Regardless, it's a lot. Uh, this is, uh, you know, these stories come out every day at this point whether it's finding uh, bad actors among those uh, immigrants who want to come in, or whether it's this kind of um, bust where you find this much, uh, you know, the narcotics trying to come into the country, nothing new. You know, we know that they want to smuggle in weapons, they want to smuggle in drugs, they want to smuggle in bad guys. Uh, and I think that's the reason for pulling the brakes uh, on a lot of this immigration stuff, in addition to the fact that we just can't absorb these numbers as fast as they're coming in. Uh, but I don't, I, I, you know, you'd wish that half this country would understand that so that we could at least be on the same page. There is no way to vet these individuals. There's no way to call, you know, the Guatemalan DMV or, you know, Honduras's public library and see who these people are uh, before letting them in. And when you have a story like this, it's an eye opener as to what the reality is what the uh, agendas may be. And I know that there's a lot of innocent people in, in, the, in the migrant pools, but there's also this type of activity as well. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me once again from Los Angeles, California. Thanks so much, Lisa. My pleasure.